Today, we're going to be going through the byte pair encoding algorithm, which is a subword tokenization algorithm used by many famous uh, natural language processing models, including GPT. So let's get right into it. So just a little bit of context. Um, natural language processing is a subfield of machine learning, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence, and it aims to make machines understand text at the human level. Um, but there's a problem. Machines only understand numbers, not text. So we need a process or a procedure to convert text into numbers so machines can then understand them and process them. Um, they can use these numbers to maybe predict sentiment or generate text as in like language models or anything. And this process of converting text into numbers is known as tokenization. So there are several types of tokenization, and one of them is character tokenization. So as you can see here, we have a vocabulary of 30 characters, and these are just you know the alphabets and some special symbols, and each character maps to an, a unique integer. So A maps to 1, B maps to 2, dollar sign maps to 30, etc., etc. And you can also have the uh, uppercase alphabets and many other symbols. But the purpose and the point is that this vocabulary will be relatively small. So we might top out at about maybe 100 characters. So it will be relatively small. Um, so to tokenize a piece of text using character tokenization, we get that piece of text. And for each character in the text, we just map it to its corresponding integer. So H maps to 8, E maps to 5, L maps to 12. And we do that for all characters. So it's a pretty simple tokenization algorithm, nothing too fancy. Next is word tokenization. So I think you could probably guess what this is. We have a vocabulary of words. Um, so A corresponds to 1, AB corresponds to 2, abbreviation corresponds to 3, and so on and so forth. Get all those words and assign them a unique integer. And then to tokenize a new tech, a new a piece of text, we just map each word to its corresponding integer. So for example, hello maps to 86,241, there maps to um, 129,041, and we do that for all words in the piece of text. Now, one question that you might have is, how do we actually generate this vocabulary? Well, we're not gonna just stuff all the English words into the vocabulary, because that would be wasteful. And we might never use any of the words, some of the words that are in our vocabulary. So what we do is we actually look at our training corpus. So this might be a data set of text, and we just get all of the words in that piece of text, all the unique words, and we construct this vocabulary. Now the actual training process is a bit more complicated, and we're gonna get into the training process a little later. But for now, I just wanna contrast word tokenization and, sub and um, character tokenization. So character tokenization, we have a relatively small vocabulary. You know, this will probably max out at about 100 characters. But for word tokenization, we have a very large vocabulary. And for character tokenization, we, have, we generate pretty long sequences of integers. And for word tokenization, we generate pretty short sequences of integers. So we can see we have two sides of the extreme here. We have character tokenization, which has a small vocabulary, and word tokenization, which has a large vocabulary. And we would prefer the smaller vocabulary since we want to, you know, use less memory. But character tokenization produces very long sequences of integers. And this will mean that the models processing these integers, uh, it's going to take much longer because there are just more integers to process. And word tokenization produces um, short sequences of integers. So it would be really nice if we could find a balance between these two extremes. We could, if there was an algorithm that could generate a small vocabulary and also generate reasonably sized sequences of integers. And that is what subword tokenization is about. So this is essentially a balance between word tokenization and character tokenization. And you can think of a subword as a little piece of text. So it's, it's usually not a full word, but it's not a single character as well. So you can think of a subword. I mean, I'll give you some examples. So maybe L Y or E N C E or T I O N. You know those common pieces of text. Those are subwords. 
Now, there are three pretty famous and commonly used tokenization algorithms, subword tokenization algorithms, and they are byte pair encoding, which we're going through in this video, and that's used by GPT. We also have word piece, which is used by BERT, and unigram language modeling, which is used by T5. But for this video, we're going to go through byte pair encoding. Okay, so what is the byte pair encoding algorithm? First, we start off with a vocabulary of all the unique characters in our corpus. So we just go through our corpus, get all of the unique characters, and we just put that in a set or a list. And next, we're going to repeat a series of steps. The first step is to choose the two symbols that are most frequently adjacent in the training corpus. So let's say this is A and B. So we go through our whole corpus, and we just get the counts of each of the um, bigrams. So a bigram is just a two character or two token piece. So we get all of those counts and we get the most frequent adjacent um, pair. So let's say in this case, it's A and B. So what we do is we add a new merge symbol AB to the vocabulary. So we just take this token and we add it to the vocabulary. And next we replace each adjacent AB in the corpus with the single AB token. So we replace each, so this is two tokens right here, A and a B and we just replace it with the single token AB. And we do this K times. So that might be a bit confusing and I understand. So let's actually go through an example so we can really understand how this works. Okay, I have a really simple corpus right here. It's just one sentence. Fred fed Ted bread and Ted fed Fred bread. Cool little tongue twister. See if you can say it five times fast. But this is our training corpus. And you can see I've under, underlined each individual character. And in this example, and for most examples, we're going to be treating spaces and punctuation as individual characters. All right. Next, we construct our initial vocabulary. So this is all the unique characters in our corpus. And you can see that we're including a space. And I probably should have included the comma. I don't know why I forgot that. Um, but a comma is meant to be in here. All right, let's go to the first step. Choose the two symbols that are most frequently adjacent in the training corpus. All right, it, so it turns out that D followed by a space occurs seven times, E followed by a D occurs six times, R followed by E occurs four times, and space followed by F occurs three times. And you can verify that if you would like to. So I've only shown the top four most frequent pairs but in reality, you would need to calculate all the possible pairs and their frequencies, and then you could find the most frequent pair. Uh, so just a little note for you right there, and let's get back to the video. Um, I hope that's correct. But anyways, the, yeah, so I just underlined all the D followed by a space since that's the most frequently occurring pair. So you can see that there, that occurs seven times. Next, we're gonna add this new merge symbol to the vocabulary. So you can see D space has been added to the vocabulary. And this single token consists of two characters. And the final step is to replace each adjacent D plus space with a D space in the corpus. So what this means is we're, we're gonna find everywhere where there was a D and then a space, and we're just gonna replace that with the single token D space. So here right now in this example, we have two characters, we have two tokens, and after we do the merge step, which I'm going to do now, you can see that this is just a single token. So they've been merged. And they're considered a single token. All right, so that's one iteration done. We've added one token to our vocabulary, and we have a new um, just updated corpus. And you can see that we still have D and space in our vocabulary, but we've just added a new token, D space. So that was one iteration. Let's go through the second iteration just to really drive this home. Again, we choose the two symbols that are most frequently adjacent in the training corpus. And in this case, it turns out that E followed by a D space occurs six times, R followed by E occurs four times, D space followed by an F occurs four times, and F followed by R occurs three times. So this is our most frequently occurring pair. So I'm gonna highlight those. You can see that occurs six times. We add the new merge symbol to the vocabulary. 
So there we go. E and then D and then space. And finally, we find all the occurrences. So here we have the first occurrence, E and then D space. And we're just going to merge it with the single token, E, D space. And there we go. That's merged. And that's the second iteration done. And if you run this algorithm, if you try it out, and I highly recommend you try this out, just do the merging steps. If you do four merges, you get these merge rules, as they're called. So the first and second one you already know. It turns out that the third one is F combines with R to form FR, and FR combines with ED space to form FR ED space. Now that we've done this, these merges, and let's say that we only want to do four merges, we take our vocabulary, our new vocabulary, with our additional tokens, and we assign each token a integer, a unique integer. And using this vocabulary, we can actually now tokenize new sentences. So using this vocabulary and these merge rules, we can tokenize new sentences. So let's see how to do that. I had this new to uh, this new sentence, Ted and Fred are friends. And let's see how we can tokenize this sentence. So we want to convert this sentence into a list of integers. Here are our merge rules. And what we're going to do is we're going to go one by one through each of our merge rules, and we're just going to apply the rule. So the first rule is D and a space, make a D space. So we're going to find all those occurrences. Turns out it occurs three times in our sentence. We're going to merge them, and we're done. That's the first merge rule. Then we go to the next one, uh, which is E plus D space makes a E D space. So we find all those occurrences in the sentence, and we merge them. And next, we have fr produces fr, so we find all those occurrences and merge them. And finally, fr plus ed space uh, makes fred space, so we're going to find all those occurrences and we're going to merge them. And we're done. So now we have this tokenized sentence. The final step that we have to do is convert these text tokens to integers. So using our vocabulary, we can just map each token to its corresponding integer. And there it is. So T maps to 8, as you can see here. ED space maps to 11, as you can see here. A maps to 1, and so on and so forth. And you can tokenize this entire sentence. Now, if you have a keen eye, you'll notice that I and S have question marks. And that's because they are not in our vocabulary. So we can't assign an integer to them. Now, why are they not in our vocabulary? Because we didn't see these tokens during training. So if you think about the original sentence, our corpus, which we use for training, uh, which was, I forgot, Fred and Ted bread make bread or something. Um, you can notice that there's no I or S in that corpus, which is why the vocabulary doesn't contain those tokens, which is why we can't use those to tokenize new sentences. Now, this is actually a very rare case, the specific, um, the specific example. In a real corpus, you would probably have all the characters in, in the corpus, all the alphabets. So the only reason this happened in this case is because our corpus was so small. But you don't have to worry about this in a real-world situation, at least for subword tokenization. So that was the byte pair encoding algorithm. I hope you learned something new and you found this video useful. If you liked the video, send us a like. And if you want to stay updated to when the next video comes out, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. Um, I'm aiming to get 100 subscribers by the end of the year, so if you can make that possible, uh, that would be really much appreciated. Uh, yeah, that's basically it for this video. I will catch you in the next one. Laters.